It was definitely right to end it when it did. I mean, to come back now would just be mad, wouldn't it? Everyone must agree that you couldn't carry it on for years and years. There was nowhere really left for us to take it. It's just not even a debate for me that that was the right thing. There's not even a, a, a part of me that thinks, I wonder if we could do another one. We just mustn't. We were nobodies and we hadn't written before, hadn't directed before, hadn't acted before. But the reason they sort of let us sort of get on with it was, I think, because it didn't cost much. <laughs> David Brent. One of the important things, one of the cast requirements, was that we weren't known, we weren't famous. There's no point in doing, you know, a mock documentary if Julia Swaller is playing the receptionist or something. Dawn Tinsley, receptionist. What? <laughs> Do this raise, haven't you? Yeah. I'd say, uh, at one time or another, every bloke in the office is woken up at the crack of dawn. <laughs> what? The first time The Office went out, uh, it wasn't greatly, greatly watched or greatly uh, fated. After the focus group, they could have pulled it because we got the joint lowest score ever of any focus group along with women's bowls. So it's pretty bad. It must have been worrying for the BBC. You're a twat, Gareth. You're a twat and a nubbend. I'm still not listening, so it's not offending me, sir. Right, OK, so you won't hear this. You're a cock, you're a cock, you're a cock. You're a cock. It was this show that was on BBC Two Monday night that, um, with no stars in it, um, that could easily have fallen by the wayside, and it didn't, and it really, um, it hit. Gradually, you become more known, and that's really weird, and everyone has their own experiences. I knew the show had sort of taken off when um, I was walking home one night, and I was recognised by... I don't know what the PC word for them is. A tramp. A hobo. A homeless. And uh, he came, it was a proper one, like a young one, right? And he went, ah, oh, oh man, I, I don't know where the homeless watch it, through Dixon's window or something, right? But he went, oh man, he said, I've just been to HMV, I've just nicked loaded your DVDs. I get recognised all the time. I just moved into a place which is very close to a sixth form college. Uh, and that's a night. That can be a nightmare at lunchtime or home time. They they go crazy if if a pack of them see Gareth walking past. So I, I've learnt all the detours. It is sort of creepy being recognised. It is creepy having your picture taken when you walk along the street. Um, but I think as long as you handle it well, there's nothing to worry about. I think some people caught it, and uh, some people that get in trouble, you know, with the tabloids or whatever, they do sort of caught it. You, you know, what you don't do is just go out every night and be seen coming out of Stringfellows or China White's pissed up or coked up, um, you know, with a with a slapper. Do you know what I mean? Just you, all I've got to do something with my Tuesday night. Because <laughs> <laughs> at the moment, <laughs> you know. You will never work in a place like this again. This is brilliant fact. Yeah? And you'll never have another boss like me, someone who's basically a chilled out entertainer. I have so many favourite scenes, don't really know where to start. My favourite scenes from The Office. My favourite scenes, uh Free love on the free love freeway. The love is free and the freeway's long. I got some hot love on the hot love highway. Going home cos my baby's gone, she's gone. Free love on the free love freeway. My favourite episode is still uh, episode four, series one. I thought episode four of series one was really good. So boring, but everybody sort of says episode four with the whole um, training and the whole guitar thing. <laughs> My favourite scene from that episode is probably the scene where I come in and declare that my fantasy would be... Two lesbians, probably. Sisters. I'm just watching. It still makes me cringe and laugh. OK, um... Tim, do you have one? Yeah, I never thought I'd say this, but can I hear more from Gareth, please? I like the comic relief episode. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I'll tell you what I love. What? That crazy dance you do. <laughs> it's just been shown so many times. I th I'm almost... <laughs> please. Whoa, please. Mate. No, I'm... No, I'm well, don't mention it then or I will... It is just... 
<laughs> Steve, <laughs> don't mention it then. Just please never do it. <laughs> I know. I know <laughs> <one. Cut. laughs> I honestly don't remember doing it. I look like a, an orangutan. I didn't realise my legs were so short. I got a pot belly. I got a ridiculous look on my face. And as I walk along that the street, that is actually how you look. I know, but I didn't know that. <laughs> The last episode of series two is uh, incredible. Don't, don't, can I just have a word in there? I love the, the point when he takes off his microphone and, and everything goes quiet for that, that last few minutes. It seemed to last an age when you were watching it, and it was like, oh, surely, surely we can't do this. People are going to be turning, you know, up their volume and thinking, what the hell's happened to my TV? Everyone since then has said to me, what did you and Martin say to each other in that room? And it's so weird, because suddenly when someone asked me, it felt private. That's really ridiculous. Why would it feel private? It really did. And I was just like, oh, you know what? I'm just going to keep that to myself. But that's really stupid. Why would I want to keep it to myself? It's acting. If you want the rainbow, you've got to put up with the rain. Do you know which philosopher said that? Dolly Parton. Yeah. And people say she's just a big pair of tits. We were going to end it after the second series, but we thought, you know, we could have a bit of a cliffhanger and make that complete and then come back and, and tie up the loose ends of the story. When we came to write the specials, we took a visit, do you remember that? We took a visit to Slough with yeah. uh, our friend, comedian Jimmy Carr. He drove us around Slough because he's from Slough. We're looking for a place where Brent, David Brent, would live. And so we think a, a, a quite a nice new estate, not too expensive, but not too um, terrible. And where are we here, Jimmy? Because this uh, looks perfect Sort of fisher Price mansions, really. This it's is... nice, it's, you know, it's kind of a mix of flats and, and houses, and they're all sort of new But this, this is perfect. That I think um, David Brent lives here. We tried to get everyone together for a, a read-through. We normally have a little read-through and everyone just reads the scripts and we'd make any changes. But uh, I think it was impossible this time. Everyone was doing films. Mackenzie was off making films. Uh, Lucy was in America, I think. Just couldn't get anyone together. I think, I, I think it was me, Ricky, and Howard Brown from the Halifax. The yeah. ads, I think they were yeah. the only three people there. And I only made the last hour because I was opening a leisure centre in Newport Pagnell with Big Keith. Yeah. That's not his real name. It is now. Is it? Yeah. Changed it. <laughs> <laughs> two series, two Christmas specials, never paid attention. <laughs> I used to say, you know, it's different on every other shoot. You know, if you make a film, anything like that, you can't muck around, it's all filming the camera. Yeah, I'll do what I want. <laughs> Did you see him? Did you see him nod at me? That one. <laughs> Rick, can you talk to for a second? When we got to the Christmas specials, you know, we, I thought it'd be different. Nah. Ah! Still winding up Martin, still trying to ruin scenes by just telling him stupid stuff. On the way to work, maybe Ricky had had a gr one of his great ideas, as I like to call them, uh, and thought, not only can I make the working day longer, but how can I make it less productive? Because he knows I will sometimes laugh at what he does. He kind of created a, a whole new bit of business. I'm coming up, so you better get a party started. Shamal. <laughs> <laughs> he can't stop a scene. He can't stop a take. He has to go with it. And if he laughs, it's his fault. So it was not only Shamal, there was also uh, Tim, Tim, Timbo. Timber. And so, like, made this kind of sound of like, timber. Hey. Timbo. Timber. <laughs> <laughs> There's also Tim Canterbury, so we should be led forward to the Bishop of Canterbury. Tim Canterbury. Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Bishop Muzarewa. <laughs> Bishop Muzarewa, he said, which is a name I have not heard since about 1980, and it really made me laugh. Bishop Muzarewa, like that. Oh, it's all good stuff. It's all good work. <laughs> okay. So that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. Is it though? <laughs> there he is, Mr. Canterbury, Archbishop of Canterbury, Bishop Muzarewa. 
washing the bishop. <laughs> I don't know exactly why he he did that. It's because he wanted to see me, the more professional and experienced of the two actors, fumble. <laughs> and then there's pictures. There's always pictures drawn. Lots of pictures of unspeakable things. But Ricky likes to draw pictures and then present them to you. Uh, and nonchalantly, so the camera can't see. Just below the camera level, he'll present something horrific. Not right, is it? Not right. <laughs> I've got those pictures. They're safe. They're my Diana letters. From the start, I know that everybody had quite liked to think of a romantic ending. I think a lot of people initially thought that David Brent was the focus of the show, but really for us, I think it was always the Tim and Dawn love story and their sort of storyline was uh, wow. was kind of the heart of the was the heart of the show. I was just said you were leaving. Me? <laughs> Say it isn't so. Because it ran fast. It is. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Were you going to tell me or? <laughs> God, yeah. Steve Merchant had rung me um, and said, oh, I think we've shot ourselves in the foot a bit um, by sending um, Dawn and Lee off to Florida because now we've got to get her back. The cost of living out of here is so cheap. You can live on a pittance. In fact, our situation here is almost as good as it was in Slough, isn't it? Definitely. It's just suddenly struck us that if a documentary crew is making a documentary, they can invite people back. What if we were able to arrange for you to go back? There's a million reasons we can't go. So. What do you mean arranging? Well, if we were able to take care of everything, would you want to go back? Yeah, of course. Let's talk about it first. Is that a genuine offer? Documentaries do that all the time. People think they don't interfere, but of course they do. Yeah. You know, I was always worried about that's when it interfering that um, watching wildlife documentaries. When I was growing up, I was thinking they'd go, and "There's the lion. <gasps> He's seen the, the young antelope." Right? And I was thinking. If I was watching that, I'd go, run, there's a fucking lion! And they never did. And I hated it when the lion got there and ate this little creature in front of everybody. And I said to my mum, why didn't they stop it? And my mum said, well, you can't interfere with nature. And I thought, oh, I'd like to see the lion turn on David Attenborough. And what do they do then? The crew would go, sorry, Dave, go, he's eating the old bollocks. So it's okay to be ripped apart of your little impala, but if you're award-winning David Attenborough, they get the lion off you. One law for the Attenborough, one for the little impala. <sighs> A new dawn. <laughs> she looks a bit... Uh, a younger model there. I'm not a model. Not as bright as dawn, I think. When I first got the scripts for the specials, I was just like, yeah, let's see what happened. I didn't know anything that was going to happen. And I decided to take it to my little local coffee shop and, um, and read it, and it was a joy. And then as soon as the bit came where Dawn was getting out of the car to come back to Wernham Hog to see everybody for the first time. I just had these tingles up my spine. No Lee? Um, no, he's um, at his mum's. Hey. It was like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And I, that's mad because actually reading something doesn't normally make me have, have that reaction. And then I cried. So this has been nice. It's been it has. Good night, isn't it? Yeah. I guess. Good seeing you again. Look after yourself. I will. Have a good life. I could keep in touch. Yeah, I will. I might. No, I will. I will. Anyway. After the second and concluding part of the Christmas special went out. It's really nice seeing you, Dawn. You too. Good to see you. I got about um, 14 texts on my phone from various people, you know, just saying I'm in tears and I'm crying. My mum and dad had been out. Yeah, um, like in, in sort of Shakespeare or something. Like Shakespeare? Yeah. Yeah, I love him. Just like Shakespeare. What love, Shakespeare are you thinking I of? Love I, love I, know you're a big fan. I, I do like Shakespeare. Yeah, so don't Shakespeare. be fooled by this image. I love all, all the Shakespeare stuff. Yeah, what sort well, of. And what do you. Well, like, like Romeo and Juliet. That is what I thought. Yeah. Tim and Dawn, Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, in what way? Huh? Same. Same. You've read Romeo and Juliet. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I've seen it. I've seen it. And yeah. What, what happens planned. in Romeo and Juliet? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> Lots of stuff. All the. They, um. They uh, they meet and they um, they sort of fall in love, mm -hmm. but because uh, it's olden days, they uh, 
all dressed uh, dressed differently, but and then they after they meet, it's about two hours of all Shakespeare stuff. Mm -hmm. I can't understand what they're saying because it's all gobbledygook, but it doesn't matter in that because love is um, blind and deaf, so it doesn't matter what you. Right. And then um, I think she plays hard to get for a little while. <laughs> She's on the balcony high up, and he's going, "Why are you up there?" She's going, well, come up if you want some. And she lets her hair down, and he climbs up, and... <laughs> They're straight to it. Sure. <laughs> Gives sure. her one. Do you like it? Oh, shall I put that on you? Brilliant. Twice. I was already wet, so the joke's on her. Three. Tart. The fact that for a long time it was bleak in many ways and then I think some uh, a journalist wrote that the weather broke and I really liked that phrase that after, out of everything that happened it was like oh my god suddenly without being completely over the top Brent had some hope in his life he told Finchie to fuck off which is probably the best moment for me. That is probably the only scene where I got a little bit of an adrenaline rush just saying it just saying Chris <laughs> yeah. why don't you fuck off. The important thing was a change in attitude, that's all. Nothing definitive, he just went to Finch, fuck off. And that was great, I really enjoyed doing that. Well, I am beginning to wonder if your heart is really in this job. Dawn, you Dawn, shouldn't oh, be behind oh. there. You don't work here anymore. Look at the boss. <laughs> Look at him. Look at his little boss face. At the end of the Christmas specials, there was no particular closure for Gareth, where there was for Brent and for Dawn and Tim. But I think that's absolutely right. I think about what Gareth could be doing now, and. The fact is he'd be at Wernham Hog in much the same position as he always was. And I think, look at it again in, you know, ten years' time, he'd still be in pretty much the same position. I think that um, Dawn and Tim will just naturally have moved in together and that won't be a thing where it's like, let's spend 18 months together and decide about this. I think he would still be there, but maybe a bit happier. It'd be nice to go, yeah, no, she's got a man and, and now she's like a famous illustrator, but let's face it, it's Slough and it's the real world and I think that probably she still will be doing receptionist, but she'll be dead happy. Wrong. Well, that's a bit ungracious. Well, they've got no idea. Why do, why do actors go, oh, I think they'd be doing this. I'll tell you what they'd be doing, whatever I fucking write. <laughs> Learn the lines. <laughs> that's a bit ungracious, though. Everyone's allowed well, to think where they might be yeah, in the future. Yeah, don't try and worm your way in onto writing. You're actors. Your hired hands. Um, now, you know what this is about. Obviously, you've seen the picture, you know, David on, on the I computer. I saw it, I saw it. Yeah, and we've all had a bit of a laugh about it, haven't we? It's funny. <laughs> yeah. There's a time when the joking has to stop, though. People ask me if I'm worried about escaping the shadow of the office, and is Gareth my Rodney Trotter? I had a dream the other night that I went on to do my own studio-based sitcom. Gareth Keenan Investigates, where he opens a, a private investigation agency, a studio based with canned laughter. And it, in this, this sitcom is so poorly received that it ended up with uh, the original series being stripped of its BAFTAs. It's hard to escape the uh, part of Dawn. I think you have to be a little bit careful with your choices. I'm not going to play a receptionist for a while. The happiness about being involved in it, I think, outweighs the worry about escaping the shadow. If people are still shouting Tim at me when I'm 55, I will kind of understand it, but I will sort of as well wonder why I haven't done something else that <laughs> makes them not shout Tim at me. Do you know what I mean? There are, there are a lot worse things to be shouted at me. Do you know what I mean? There are a lot worse. Uh, most of them were shouted at me during the filming of the show. If I'm always associated with, with Gareth Keenan, then that's not a bad thing to be associated with. So what becomes of you, my love? When they have finally stripped you of the handbags and the glad rags that your granddad's had to sweat so you could buy. I was in New York last week for the Peabody Awards and at the end of it there was a girl who'd come up to me and um, I had got lots of DVDs to sign and everything and she said that she'd flown from Canada to New York in order to come and meet someone from the office and I, that made me just take a step back and go, oh my God, that is mad. I don't know that I'll do anything that has that kind of impact in that kind of way again. Where can you go from there? I don't know. 
we sort of predicted that we'd be pleased with it. But no, you could never dream of the success. There is a kind of fondness knowing that we were all part of the same gang, you know, in a job well done. Sing a song of sixpence for your sake And take a bottle full of rye Four and twenty blackbirds in a cake A bake of all in a pie They told me you miss school today So I suggest you just throw away The handbags and the glad rags That your granddad's had no sweat to you I'd be hard pushed to find a job where you laughed as much every day, do you know what I mean? And where you were genuinely that happy to go to work. I, I can't see a, a situation where we'd all be back together as, as one team working together. And yeah, that's sad. That's, that's sort of the end of an era. And I'm just sorry that we won't work together again. It's pretty sad. Get over it. <laughs> Harsh. We're not going to work together again. Next. It's tough. Where are you going? Huh? Is that it then, is it? Yeah, got a sauna. <laughs> <laughs>